We are talking today with William Hartung. William Hartung is director of the Arms and Security Initiative at the New America Foundation. Before that, he worked for 15 years as director of the Arms Trade Resource Center at the World Policy Institute at the New School in New York City. His writings have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. He is also author of several books, including And Weapons for All, How Much Are You Making on the War, Daddy? A Quick and Dirty Guide to War Profiteering in the Bush Administration. And he is here to talk about his latest book, Prophets of War, Lockheed Martin and the Making of the Military-Industrial Complex. Start out, uh, before we talk about the book, can you tell us a bit about the Arms and Security Initiative at the New America Foundation? Well, uh, it's kind of a follow-on to a project I had at the World Policy Institute at the New School. And basically, we cover pretty broad range, uh, military budget, uh, missile defense, uh, international arms trade, uh, basically trying to look at um, alternative policies in a lot of these areas. And we're um, at the New America Foundation, which is kind of a middle of the road, well, democratic leaning think tank uh, based in Washington, which does uh, work on domestic and foreign policy. So we're a part of their foreign policy uh, branch. Tell us what was the motivation in writing your new book, Profits of War? Well, I... Um, had worked on these issues going back to the late Carter administration. And it seemed like every time I turned around, there was Lockheed Martin. Um, you know, whether it was the arms trade, whether it was missile defense uh, in the 90s, uh, they were at the forefront of the merger boom that actually created Lockheed Martin from two separate companies. Um, you know, and then I, I learned going back that they were involved in some of the most interesting sort of influence peddling and corruption scandals, as, as well as being... Um, cutting edge in some of the technology. So it seemed like just a sort of too interesting to pass up given my, you know, background in the subject and my interest in, uh, you know, finding a new way at it. All right. So can you tell us about the history of Lockheed Martin, uh, starting with their beginnings, if you would? Well, it started out with two brothers, uh, Alan and Malcolm Lockheed, who originally spelled their name L-O-U-G-H-E-A-D, which was pronounced Lockheed. But, um, uh, a lot of people were calling Alan Lughead, and so he decided to change the spelling of the name uh, to the current spelling, L-O-C-K-H-E-E-D. Uh, but it took him about 30, 40 years to do that, so I guess he got a lot of uh, Lughead this and Lughead that before he uh, finally decided it was time for the change. Uh, but the two brothers were kind of early aviation enthusiasts. Um, Alan learned to pilot a plane around 1910, 1912, uh, you know, less than a decade after the Wright brothers' first flight. Um, Malcolm was interested in the auto industry and learned some skills there that they applied to making um, aircraft. So uh, their first plane was used to fly uh, basically tourists and, you know, thrill seekers around the San Francisco Bay, and they built it in a garage in San Francisco. And th that was how they made their initial capital, was 5 or $10 a pop uh, just flying people around San Francisco Bay, including at a major Pacific uh, exposition where they had lost the contract, but the other, uh, the competitor crashed his only plane. And so they sort of by, uh, you know, by forfeit ended up getting that concession. All right. And where did it go from there? How did they uh, get involved with doing military stuff? Well, originally they kind of steered clear of it and there wasn't a lot to be had. They, they sort of missed the uh, World War I um, procurements because they only started in 1916 and they didn't have anything ready to really sell to the military. Uh, so after that, there wasn't a lot of business to be had. In fact, Malcolm got fed up and went into the auto industry permanently, created a hydraulic brake system that became the industry standard for quite a while. But, uh, you know, by 1918, 1919, he, he just couldn't, his nerves couldn't take it. You know, they didn't have the business. They were on the verge of bankruptcy. And uh, all through the 20s, they were trying to build uh, planes for uh, transport or for the post office. And then in the 30s, finally, um, they were bought by a financier named Robert Gross, who, you know, initially also wanted to steer clear of the military. But finally, he wrote to one of his colleagues, you know, uh, we're not going to make it unless we get contracts for war machines. So they started in the mid-30s, and it really picked up when they made the Hudson bomber, which they sold to Britain. Uh, when Britain was first uh, concerned about uh, Hitler. So in the late 30s, before they sold much to the U.S. government, they became the largest uh, company in the aircraft industry by selling these bombers uh, to, the Britain, to, to the Brits. Mm -hmm. 
But the Brits ended up buying a lot of them. Oh, yes, yes. They bought a couple thousand, and um, it was a huge boon to Lockheed because they were, you know, they had maybe a thousand or so employees at most in the late 30s. And between the British buys and uh, finally the ramping up of the U.S. war effort, uh, they had 91,000 employees by 1943. So overnight, uh, you know, they just boomed, and they were, uh, you know, short of workers. They were getting, uh, using teenagers and out-of-work actors and uh, migrants from the Midwest and South and pretty much anybody they could employ. And, it, you know, given the um, circumstances, it's probably surprising that the aircraft were as good as they were, you know, given that these people were just being thrown at this task without a lot of background in uh what was still, you know, a relatively young uh, field of endeavor. So World War II winds up, and what happened to them then? Well, right after the war, it was a crisis in the industry because there actually was substantial demobilization, uh, not just of troops, but also of uh, weapons procurement. And uh, Robert Gross described it as, he said, I will never forget those short, appalling weeks and he wasn't talking about the weeks, you know, during the war, which was certainly appalling, but the weeks after the war, uh, when his business dropped uh, precipitously. And so the uh, companies were trying to figure out, you know, how can we get back, if not to World War II levels, at least at a steady level of uh, government spending so we can keep this industry going. And they decided what they needed was some sort of blue ribbon panel that would sort of make the case for a permanent large uh, aircraft and arms industry. And so they lobbied, and Congress created one, uh, as did the Truman administration. So there were two of these. And one of them, the Thin Letter Commission, became the more uh, influential of the two. And uh, Wayne Biddle, who wrote a very good book on this called uh, Barons of the Sky, um, pointed out that the Thin Letter Commission uh, interviewed, uh, took testimony from 150 witnesses and 149 of them were involved directly in the aircraft industry, either in the Air Force or in the uh, companies. And there was one guy who was a journalist who was very pro-industry, pro-buildup. So uh, when Robert Gross had been pitching this to Congress, he said, you know, we need a citizens panel that's disinterested, that's just looking at the broader interests of the country, and uh, I'm sure they will come to the conclusion that we need... Um, you know, uh, a larger aircraft industry, more government support for it, uh, for national security, as well as uh, technological, you know, uh, business reasons, uh, giving us a technological edge over other uh, countries. Uh, but in fact, it ends up they kind of wired it with this panel that had, you know, 99.9% uh, .9 people who had a self-interest in promoting uh, uh, aircraft as weapons. And so they uh, proposed an 80% increase in the military budget, large increases in Army and Navy aircraft procurement. And this sort of started the thing rolling in the right direction, at least from the point of view of the uh, industry. So the whole industry benefited from that, not just uh, Lockheed. Right. And, you know, uh, Gross was one of the more uh, aggressive advocates of the policy, but uh, you know, the head of Douglas Aircraft, uh, the people from Boeing, all the companies weighed in on this, and uh, it was sort of a joint effort. In fact, the uh, they had formed a trade association, the Aircraft Industries Association, which was uh, ended up being headed up by a guy named Oliver Eccles, who had been the head of Army procurement during World War II. So it's kind of the beginning, or at least one of the more prominent cases of the revolving door, where you have somebody who goes from a position in government and then... Uh, goes into private industry in the same uh, area that they had worked in government, then uses their connections to reach back into the government to try to get their uh, former colleagues to make decisions on behalf of their company. So, um, you know, so they had a, a kind of a full court press on this, and, and, you know, the different companies as well as their trade association uh, pushed vigorously for this uh, blue ribbon panel approach, which they thought would be the best way to uh, sell this build up to the public. All right. So after World War II, they pull this uh, blue ribbon panel together, and they get the backing on that for funding. What happens after that? Well, Korea really kind of rescued the industry because there were a lot of things going on. There was the Fin Letter Commission. There was the long telegram uh, that was the beginning of containment, um, you know, written by George Kennan, which kind of painted uh, the Soviet Union as this, 
kind of, you know, uh, all-encompassing atheistic power that was going to be pressing against us at every turn all over the world. Um, so these kind of rhetorical and political uh, pushes for a larger arms establishment were not really getting a lot of traction until the war in Korea. Then a lot of that logic sort of came to be integrated into government policy. Uh, people like Robert Gross uh, tried to capitalize on that. He gave a speech to the Western Aircraft Manufacturers Association where he said, you know, we need, um, if we're going to be fighting in places like Korea and elsewhere around the world to defend, uh, you know, our values and defend democracy, we're going to need to move men and materials quickly to all these different places. And to do that, you need fast transport and you need to do it uh, from the air. So he was making the case for essentially if you want to police the globe you need our products and you need to give us enough money to make a new generation of these products. So uh, there was the benefits of the war itself and then there was the way that it was utilized to try to uh, further that notion of a permanent large uh, arms establishment. And that was the same period when we're really seeing the tail end of World War II is when the Germans started using jet engines. Uh, was that the same period when America started producing jet engines? Yeah, it was around the same period. And, um, you know, they, Lockheed was, um, you know, they, they didn't build them themselves. They were produced by other companies. And Lockheed was, you know, built the airframes, and they were sort of the assembler of the final uh, product. But um, in addition to the, uh, you know, the advent of, of uh you know, jet fighters and jet aircraft, uh, they became involved in the missile industry, uh, ballistic missiles, and they built the uh, Polaris uh, submarine launch ballistic missile uh, in the 50s. And uh, by all accounts, they did a good job in the sense of the thing worked, although, of course, uh, thankfully, we never put it to the test in, in a war. We wouldn't be here talking about this. But, um, and it came in um, around what it had been estimated to cost, which is, you know, uh, very rare in the annals of uh, military procurement, but it almost didn't get built. Uh, the there were already three or four other ballistic missile programs, and President Eisenhower was sort of saying enough is enough already. I mean, how many different ways are we going to go at this? Why don't you take one of the land-based ICBMs, figure out how to use it uh, from a submarine? But ends up that was not really workable because they were so large. You would have to have a massive boat to be able to. Uh, contain them, and also they were liquid fueled, which would be kind of very dangerous to do in the confined space uh, of a submarine. So finally, uh, he relented, and they they developed this Navy program. And there was an admiral, William Rayborn, who was a huge cheerleader for this. He went around the country giving talks about it. He encouraged the companies to do advertising on behalf of it, to go around and uh, you know have sort of mini pep rallies at their uh, factories, and uh, it was really. Um, very different from the World War II approach because, you know, where the government really was um, kind of the driving force uh, in World War II, this was more of a partnership between the government and industry in to trying to promote a uh, weapon system. So I know that uh, Lockheed Martin now is involved with nuclear weapons, at least design. When did they get involved with that? I mean, if they were involved with uh, missile production at some point in time? It was much later. Uh, basically, a system evolved. Um, you know, originally, the Atomic Energy Commission uh, controlled a nuclear weapons work, and they uh, had these facilities around the country that had been built up during the Manhattan Project. And at a certain point, they decided to have private contractors run them instead of them being government-owned facilities. And so this evolved over many years, but it wasn't until... Um, you know, the 90s or so that Lockheed bought into this system when they um, got the contract to run uh, Sandia Nuclear Weapons Laboratory in New Mexico. And also they had a piece of the work at the uh, nuclear test site in Nevada. So they made a decision uh, that they wanted to be involved in this aspect of the work and uh, essentially, you know, put their names out there to, to be a manager of one of these uh, labs. But they didn't have to... Uh, make the initial investment. Essentially, the government had already created this facility, and their job was to manage it, recruit new talent, uh, you know, make the thing work. 
let's go back to the the Korean War. Then uh, things expanded there. Uh, what happened after that uh, wrapped up? Well, one of their most successful programs was the U-2 spy plane, and the client for it was the CIA primarily, and um, they had a, a, a secret uh, research facility in the Mojave Desert, uh, which was uh, organized by uh, a young engineer named Kelly Johnson, who is, by their account, the most skilled engineer in the history of the company, and he had helped uh, when he was just out of school, built the P-38 fighter. Uh, and he had quite um, exacting standards about how things should be done. Uh, and he liked to work with a relatively small team. He wanted the, the engineers to be close to the factory floor so they could make adjustments on the fly. Uh, he rewarded people for, uh, you know, not for how many people worked for them and how big their unit was, but he tried to gauge it to the... Uh, how productive they were. So it was running against the grain of a lot of what was happening in the industry at that time. And uh, so this facility uh, at first was almost the equivalent of working in a tent. I mean, it was a pretty primitive uh, setup. And it was near uh, what had been a chemical plant. So uh, it, the, the smell was so uh, overpowering that they started calling it the uh, skunk works. And it was after a... Uh, uh, a cartoon by Al Cap where they had uh, uh, a still in, in, where, that they would uh, make whiskey out of and they would throw everything under the sun in their old shoes and whatever they could find and it was spelled uh, S-K-O-N-K in the cartoon, uh, the comic strip and so uh, they used that spelling until they were sued by uh, Al Cap's publisher and they, so they changed it to the, norm, the traditional spelling and, um, but anyway, so the Skunk Works was where they built the U-2 which was a very complicated plane. It was supposed to uh, go at such high altitudes and yet be able to uh, be still enough to take photographs that were useful of um, various uh, Soviet military facilities. And it was quite, uh, did quite a good job, uh, but unfortunately the, um, a lot of the information that was gathered was not uh, shared in a way that was useful to the public. I mean, they, they kept most of it under wraps, even though they knew, for example, there was no bomber gap with the Soviets, there was no missile gap with the Soviets. And so Eisenhower and then Nixon, even though they were getting pounded by Kennedy on this notion of a missile gap, decided not to share that information because it was classified, because they didn't want to reveal too much about their methods of gathering this stuff. Uh, but the U-2, you know, if they had used the information in a transparent way, probably could have uh, obviated uh, you know, some of the beginnings of the nuclear arms race. But it's, it's, it's always the um, question of how you use the technology, just not what the capability is that it gives you. So, um, you know, so between that and the Polaris, they really were quite successful in the 50s. They also built the uh, C-130 transport plane, which initially had some problems, but it has been a workhorse, uh, which is still used in various... Uh, variations uh, up to this day, you know, so it's uh, 50 years later. So, uh, you know, uh, it was probably one of their better decades in terms of their management and their uh, being able to produce uh, quality products, but things uh, didn't remain that way, unfortunately. Was it shortly thereafter that they started producing uh, questionable planes and other projects? Well, the 60s really were was... Uh, when the problem started to emerge, there was a large transport plane called the C-5, which um, was they started to develop kind of in the early period of the Vietnam War, before the big troop buildups. But the Air Force had decided, much along the lines of what Robert Gross had called for in the 50s, uh, that they wanted to be able to reach anywhere in the globe quickly, move significant amounts of troops and weaponry, and be able to land on... Uh, unimproved airstrips and, you know, difficult to get to uh, places. And so the C-5 was supposed to achieve all of that. And um, initially it didn't look like Lockheed was going to win that bid. Um, they, uh, there was a um, advisory panel, a technical panel within the Air Force that chose a Boeing design. But uh, uh, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, who was a mentor to Lyndon Johnson, who headed the Armed Services Committee in the Senate, basically put his two cents in, and suddenly what had been, uh, you know, going to be uh, 
a, uh, a Boeing win turned into a Lockheed win to, to build this thing. And um, uh, in later years, the mayor of Marietta, Georgia, which is where the C-5 was built, said, well, you know, Russell, he knew we didn't need that plane, you know, but he, he knew we needed it, you know, for the good of Georgia. And when it was rolled out on the assembly line, uh, Lyndon Johnson went down and gave a little speech and said, you know, a lot of places would like to have this work, but not everybody has the Georgia delegation. So, uh, you know, the circumstances of its uh, birth, so to speak, were somewhat suspect. I mean, they had political uh, imprints all over them as opposed to a uh, straight uh, competition on the merits. And so they, um, you know, it ended up that they had cost problems almost from the outset. And part of it was it was pretty amazing thing they were supposed to build. I mean, it was almost the size of a football field. Uh, it was seven stories high off the ground. It was supposed to have an engine that could had the power equivalent of uh, powering a city of 50,000 people. Uh, and then it was supposed to, it was larger than any airliner by, lar by a long shot. But it was supposed to be able to land on a strip about half the size of the normal uh, you know, length you would give for for a traditional airliner. So, you know, part of it is the Pentagon asked for things that may not have been doable, but as often happens, the companies, rather than being honest about the fact that this may not be doable, say, "Hey, I'll you know go for it. I'll I'll do my best." And then if they figure, if they bid a little bit low, they'll get further enough into the program that the government doesn't want to then waste what they've invested. And it's almost uh, like an extortion racket. You know, well, we've gone this far. I mean, we can't pull the plug, can we? you got to give us some more money, a little more money, a little more money uh, if you want your, your product. And so on the C-5, the problem was a little more money turned into $2 billion in cost overruns, which was the largest um, cost overrun in the history of uh, military procurement up to that point. So that was one of their, you know, uh, failures of the 60s. Another was the Cheyenne helicopter, which was supposed to be able to lift up like a helicopter and then fly like a normal plane. And that tripled in cost, never really was able to do its mission. Uh, a couple pilots were killed, uh, you know, flying the thing. And finally it was put out of its misery. Um, but only after about $500 million had been spent, which in those days was uh, real money. You know, whereas now it would be kind of chump change for some of these big companies. Was there any penalty uh, for the company for, you know, not following through on those contracts? Well, initially, it wasn't even clear that the Air Force was going to own up to it. Uh, you know, they tried to hide the overruns, and um, they kind of filled with the numbers, and they, they claimed that, oh, you know, we actually, the original estimate is not that different from what uh, we're seeing in terms of cost. And part of that was they were just taking some of the costs off the books altogether. The other thing is they... Uh, change the baseline. They, you know, instead of the original, you know, two billion or so that the company had promised, they said, "Oh no, no," you know, they had only promised, you know, three to four billion initially. So they were playing with the numbers. They were trying to keep Congress in the dark, and um, you know, so uh, it finally fell to uh, a whistleblower in the Air Force, a cost estimator named Ernest Fitzgerald, and he was keeping an eye on this, and he realized that. Uh, this thing, the costs were going through the roof, and that it wasn't clear it was going to be able to perform its, uh, you know, promised mission. So he, uh, you know, somewhat reluctantly, I mean, he didn't want to get fired. I mean, he was raising questions about this inside the Air Force, but he testified to Congress when Senator William Proxmire got wind of this, and his superiors did not want him to testify at all, but Proxmire was insistent. So finally they said... Uh, you can testify, but don't say anything about the C-5 and don't reveal anything about the C-5. But, of course, uh, in his prepared testimony, that was one thing. But once Proxmire started asking him questions, he didn't feel that he could just, you know, kind of stonewall him. So, you know, he said, uh, you know, what's the uh, cost overrun on the C-5? You know, Proxmire said, I hear it's as much as $2 billion. And uh, Fitzgerald said, well... You know, if current trends continue and if the engine increases at the same rate as the airframe and if the spare parts come in at the highest projected levels, then it's conceivable that you might have a cost overrun uh, in that ballpark. You know, so it was a very kind of conditioned statement, partly because he wanted to protect his job. So he didn't just come out and say, 
You're absolutely right, Senator Proxmire. Uh, but it didn't really matter because the way it played in the press was C5, you know, has $2 billion overrun. And when he came back to his office, uh, his secretary said, um, have they fired you yet? And they did not fire him, but they demoted him. And eventually they did push him out of the Air Force through some bureaucratic maneuvering. So uh, in terms of consequences for the company, uh, eventually Proxmire did get, um, he sort of stopped the gravy train at a certain point. So on the first batch of the planes, they had had some overruns, and they were going to make it up by charging even more for the second batch. And what Proxmire did was he uh, lobbied in the Congress to uh, keep them from building the full number of that second batch. And uh, he was partially successful. And so they, uh, they had to eat maybe four or five hundred million of the two billion dollar overrun. Uh, but that and the fact that they were having trouble with their airliner, the L-1011, put them in a very precarious spot. So th they paid a price, but not as big a price as the taxpayers uh, had to pay for it. And had that whistleblower not come forward, did you get the sense that either um, Lockheed or the Air Force would have put a stop to this eventually? I think it would have gone on much longer and that eventually they would have been called to account, but it probably would have been after that $2 billion was water under the bridge. So I think Proxmire and Fitzgerald saved the taxpayers, you know, a substantial sum of money. Um, there was also a whistleblower from inside Lockheed, a guy named Henry Durham, and he talked about how it worked in the factory. You know, Fitzgerald talked about kind of the bureaucratic fudging that happened inside the Air Force to cover it up. Durham talked about what it was like in the factories. You know, the fact that, for example, they were rushing these things through uh, because once you finished a plane, you got a progress payment. And when the plane was yet to be finished, there could be cash flow issues. So they were rushing these things through production, putting some of them together, missing critical spare parts, uh, and then just hoping to kind of remember to do it, you know, uh, before they put the thing in the air. And so he revealed that, and he talked about how they were buying spare parts at huge overcharges, which was a sort of forerunner of some of the scandals during the Reagan administration. Um, they would waste all kinds of resources. They'd have, you know, uh, specialized equipment at one factory, and they needed it at the other factory. And instead of using what they had, they would trash the existing stuff and buy new. So there were all these internal practices that were leading uh, to the overruns. And Durham, uh, you know, made it very clear what some of those were. And as a result, he suffered, among other things, death threats from people in Marietta, Georgia, not directed by the company, but uh, there was this environment at the time of, you know, we need these jobs, we don't want anybody getting in the way of that. And, and one of the factories uh, apparently had, uh, you know, banners put up periodically saying things like, kill Durham and kill Proxmire. Durham had to get federal marshals to protect him. So, um, you know, between uh, Fitzgerald being essentially fired, and Durham suffering death threats for his uh, activities, it wasn't exactly an invitation to be a whistleblower. I mean, it, you know, he had to show quite a lot of courage to uh, take these things on. So it was more than just a, uh, you know, speaking truth to power. It was really taking uh, great risks with your career and even uh, with your safety to, to speak about these things. It sounded like this combination of those two situations with the C-5 and the Cheyenne had put the company in a precarious situation. Did I hear that right? Yes. They actually came to the point where they were uh, threatening to go bankrupt. And their finances were in terrible shape uh, because uh, the Cheyenne was canceled. The C-5A, they had to eat some of the cost overruns. Their L-1011 airliner was not competing well with uh, Boeing and Douglas uh, products. So um, they reached a point where they came to the Nixon administration and said, you know, we need help here. And th they asked for a quarter of a million dollars in guaranteed uh, government-guaranteed loans. And people like Proxmire were not about to have that happen. You know, they felt like this company had earned the right to fail. And... Um, that the worst case, it would be reorganized through bankruptcy. They would keep the most efficient parts of it. A lot of the production could be done by other American companies like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Boeing or uh, uh, the Douglas Aircraft Corporation. So, um, you know, Proxmire's position and that of some conservatives like uh, 
Senator James Buckley of New York was um, we shouldn't be rewarding their mismanagement and inefficiency by bailing them out. But the flip side was uh, arguments by uh, some liberals, like Senator Alan Cranston of California, who had a lot of Lockheed work in his state, who basically said, you know, first of all, it's a jobs issue. Second of all, this company is intertwined so, uh, you know, intricately with the um, defense of the country, with the other companies. Uh, they build a lot of different weapon systems, like the Polaris and like the transport planes. And if they're not here to build them, who's going to do it? And so it, the argument emerged that, you know, they were too big to fail, much in the way that the uh, argument about the banks in recent years, that they're too big to fail. And so uh, there was a, a huge battle in the Senate in particular, and uh, it came down to a uh, single vote margin. And the margin was the senator from Montana, Lee Metcalf, who um, originally was going to vote against the bailout, but uh, he was buttonholed by Alan Cranston, who said, do you really want to be the one who's responsible for the loss of all these jobs? And afterwards, Metcalf you know, admitted that that was the uh, clinching argument why he decided to vote for the bailout. And the New York Times did an analysis afterwards, and there was this fascinating kind of, you know, geography of the vote. Uh, almost everybody with a Lockheed uh, factory in their state or district voted for the bailout. A lot of places that had uh, Boeing or uh, McDonald plants uh, voted against the bailout because they figured if Lockheed went under, the companies in their states would get the business. Uh, and then the unions, uh, there was a split between the machinists and the UAW based on which companies they worked for. And then there was the swing vote, people who didn't have either company in their districts or states. And they sort of broke down a little bit on ideological lines. Some of the conservatives said we shouldn't be subsidizing uh, these companies. They should fail, you know, the way you would fail in a, the regular marketplace. And then some of the liberals viewed it as a jobs issue, like Hubert Humphrey, for example. So uh, it was quite the fight, and, and a lot of it was uh, couched in terms of really what capitalism is about. Is it about companies, you know, kind of winning on the merits, or is it about them getting bailed out by the government? And uh, Proxmire coined the term corporate welfare during the course of this bailout debate, and he said this was sort of the uh, ultimate example of government corporate welfare for, uh, you know, a company like Lockheed. So. Um, they were able to get that loan, and it, it gave them a little bit of slack, but they still uh, needed to sell the airliner. If they couldn't sell the L-1011, uh, they really weren't going to be able to pay back the loan. And so it put them in a very difficult position. And how close was this to when uh, Chrysler was getting their bailout? It was right at the same time, essentially. So they, they were the sort of the models for the corporate bailout. They're the first you know, big, major... Uh, corporate bailouts of the modern era and kind of a, you know, forerunners of some of the things we've seen lately, which of course are much on a much larger scale. And they got their bailout. They did indeed. Um, but in order to uh, pay back the money, they uh, had to engage in unethical business practices. Uh, you know, they basically, uh, to sell the L-1011 in Japan, for example, they hired a uh, ex-war criminal, an organized crime figure named Mr. Kodama, who had been one of the founders of the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, who knew the heads of the airline, who basically was wired into every possible angle of the economic and political structure of Japan. And he helped uh, distribute bribes of $1.7 million to the Japanese prime minister, to other key figures. Um, there was a Lockheed Vice President, Carl Kachian, who sort of quarterbacked this effort. And in one day, he signed off on uh, something like 3 to $4 million in bribes. And that was just the opening gambit. And we never did find out exactly how much they spent in Japan, but it was in the, in the millions and millions. Um, and uh, so anyway, it worked. They got the contract. Uh, President Nixon sort of weighed in in their favor. And uh, the British Prime Minister, Edward Heath, came to Japan lobbied for this because uh, there was a British engine in the L-1011. And so you had two countries, you know, two leaders, two countries leaning on the Japanese to buy this, as well as the, the bribes. Uh, and they did similar things in uh, Italy, in the Netherlands, in Indonesia, in Saudi Arabia. And there were some, you know, what would have been comical episodes if uh, there wasn't so much at stake. But 
For example, in Italy, they kept a little black book with the um, uh, the code names for the different people that they were passing money through or bribing. And there was a nickname, Antelope Cobbler, which was the nickname for the Italian prime minister. And when these books were uh, revealed during the investigations of this by the church committee in uh, the Senate, uh, they were trying to figure out which Italian prime minister this was. But during the period, uh, about two years, where they were using this nickname, there had been th three different governments in Italy. So they couldn't figure out which of the three prime ministers was the antelope cobbler who was getting the money. Uh, but there was uh, some correspondence within the company where they had, there had been a cycle of government in Italy. They had taken care of everybody. Uh, you know, there was like a set fee per plane for bribes. And it looked like the government was going to fall. And they were freaking out. It was like, you know, we got to get this deal done. Otherwise, we've got to start all over, you know, all the round of bribes. So the companies were um, getting played to some degree, even as they were playing uh, the government figures. For example, in uh, the Netherlands, Prince Bernhard uh, ended up working both for Lockheed and for Northrop and asking both of them for bribes, both of them for various considerations, uh, even though he was lobbying Basically, they're competing for the same work, and he was lobbying for both sides of the competition. So, uh, you know, sometimes they got kind of taken to the cleaners on this stuff, even though they were, uh, you know, doing unethical practices themselves. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, they used Adan Khashoggi, who uh, later became famous during the Iran-Contra scandal in the 80s. And um, they, they were writing, uh, uh, you know, memos around the company saying, we don't know if this guy is passing the bribes on or if he's keeping it himself, you know, we can't figure this out. And uh, so anyway, they, they kept getting the deals. And so they figured, well, he's keeping it, he's, he's spreading it around, and, you know, we don't really care as long as we get to sell the planes. And in fact, um, when Senator Proxmire was quizzing the Lockheed executive about this, he was trying to pin down Carl Koch, and he said, well, you know, you can't tell me you don't even know where the money's going. I mean, if you're bribing somebody, don't you know whether it ends up with that person? And Kachin said, no, we have no idea. But as long as we get the deal, we assume that they bribed the right person. Although he didn't like to use the word bribery. They called them uh, kickbacks because his lawyer seemed to think that that had some um, less injurious legal meaning in terms of any consequences for the, for the company. So, uh, you know, so you had them spreading money all over the world to sell the L-1011. And it was uh, a result of some of those deals that allowed them eventually to pay back the government uh, loan guarantees. But of course, then uh, they got in uh, big trouble for the bribery itself. Several executives stepped down. Uh, Proxmire helped uh, pass the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which was the first anti-bribery statute. Uh, before that, as bribery, at least from the US perspective, was considered legal. And they actually were even um, able to charge it off on their taxes. As long as they used a middleman, you know, they could say, well, this is just a cost of doing business. So, um, you know, they, they were indirectly responsible for this reform, which has at least curbed the more, um, you know, egregious forms of bribery. I mean, people aren't walking around with paper bags full of money anymore, or at least not as often as they used to. What happened then? Move forward to uh, 80s, 90s? and Well, you know, the, the late 60s and early 70s had been very tough times for the company between the bailout and the bribery scandal. Um, and then we, we got into the period, the post-Vietnam period, where military spending started to come down. In the Carter years, uh, before the buildups that happened after the fall of the Shah of Iran and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, there was a period where military spending was at its lowest level since about 1951. So the companies were scrambling after a smaller budget, and Lockheed Martin was disadvantaged in some ways because of all the problems that it had. But then uh, Reagan came to the rescue. You know, Ronald Reagan campaigned basically on an anti-communist theme, first against Gerald Ford, who he almost uh, took out, and then against Carter. And he was the, the guy who talked about the evil empire and talked about how the Soviets essentially were sort of like 10 feet tall and we were only five foot two and then we were gonna have to catch up to them So when he came in He had the biggest peacetime military buildup in the history of the country And he doubled spending on things like ballistic missiles, which was a big Lockheed Martin uh, product. So they uh, 
you know, their their military contracts went from about two billion to four billion in a two year, three year period. Uh, so finally, they were kind of out of the woods. You know, they were very profitable. They had a sympathetic president, uh, but then again, they ran into uh, some scandals that sort of tarnished their image and um, eventually led to reductions in the Pentagon budget. Can you go into that a bit? How I can't imagine the Pentagon budget being reduced by scandals. Well, I think you know uh, miracles happen sometimes. Uh, the um, well, one of the problems they had that was revealed was they were overcharging for uh, parts, uh, much as Henry Durham had described in the early 70s. Uh, but these were much more visible to the public. It were things like the uh, $600 toilet seat and the $7,000 coffee maker and the $435 hammer. Uh, and these had been revealed partly as a result of uh, Ernest Fitzgerald, who had finally gotten his job back at the Pentagon. And he was working with a woman on the outside named Dina Razor, who started a a project called the Project on Military Procurement, which used whistleblowers. But instead of the old method, where the whistleblower would risk their career, they served sort of as moles. They would stay at their jobs, and they would pass along data that indicated, you know, the nature of these overcharges. So while there were a few uh, people who came public, there were also these kind of, uh, you know, moles within the system, which uh, Fitzgerald called closet patriots, who were handing out the information so they could tell about the uh, spare parts overcharges. And, um, you know, Lockheed had various defenses. Um, you know, one thing they said was, you know, it's not a toilet seat. It's the cover of the toilet seat that we overcharged for. <laughs> and um, it was only relevant from the point of view of uh, satire because Herb Block, the Washington Post cartoonist, had this series of, car uh, you know, strips where... Um, Casper Weinberger, the defense secretary for Reagan, had this toilet seat around his neck. And uh, so, you know, if, if they had known that it was a toilet cover, there goes the cartoon. You know, I mean, maybe he could wear it as a hat or something, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't quite as compelling a, a graphic image. Um, and then they said, well, you know, we buy so few of these, you know, that, it, of course, if you're going to buy in small numbers, it's going to cost you more. Uh, and then they said, you know, it's a very sophisticated product. This isn't just a regular toilet seat. And so they tried all the various rationales, and none of them were really uh, flying with the public or the Congress. So finally they said, well, all right, we'll, you know, we reviewed our, uh, you know, uh, methodology here, and actually we overcharged you $100 per toilet seat. So we'll charge you 544 instead of 642 uh, you know, per item. And they still got this reign of criticism. Finally, they said, all right, we'll give them to you for a dollar. You know, let's just get this off the table because we don't want it to uh, tarnish our image or undercut the larger, uh, you know, push for military spending. And, um, you know, uh, before that finally happened, though, there was an executive uh, who did the, uh, named Robert uh, Ormsby who wrote a piece for... Aviation Week, uh, the specialty magazine, where he basically blamed the critics. He said, well, it's, you know, it's irresponsible writing in the press, it's special interest uh, groups, by which he meant Dina Razor's nonprofit, which had exposed this. People just want to get their names in the paper. You know, we build a good product. And, you know, most of all, it's undermining the morale of our troops. You know, so <laughs> revealing that they're wasting tax dollars that could have been used to support the troops was sort of twisted around in his worldview as being something that was going to hurt the morale of the troops. So basically, you know, any criticism of the Pentagon for any reason or of the contractors he was trying to say was um, unpatriotic. And that argument ultimately didn't work either. And the uh, spare parts controversy, um, along with the beginnings of the shift uh, the Gorbachev-Reagan uh, rapprochement on things like nuclear weapons did contribute to what was a, a downward path in military spending, which went further, of course, with the end of the Cold War. So, uh, you, you know, it did come back to haunt them, although uh, they did pretty well with them for themselves for most of the 80s. And they also, um, of course, were benefiting from the missile defense program, which was a huge Reagan initiative. So then you... We jump forward to the war on terror. Is that when spending started ramping up again? 
Well, they had to uh, come up with a strategy for surviving the post-Cold War period. And so this was when Lockheed Martin was created. Um, Norman Augustine, who ran Martin Marietta, sort of looked at the landscape and said, you know, uh, we're going to get hit with lower budgets here. Uh, we should merge a lot of these companies. And then, from his point of view, if he could build a company based on the parts of all these other companies and be the biggest kid on the block, then inevitably, when military spending went back up again, he would be able to seize a larger part of that growing pie. So he was looking ahead, you know, figuring maybe in five, six years we'll have an upswing and we'll be better, the best position to capitalize on it. And he was um, uh, helped in that by William Perry, uh, the defense secretary at the time, who basically held a meeting called the Last Supper, where um, he sort of said to the executives, you know, if you look to your right and look to your left, one of you's got to go out of business, you know, one of you three, because we just can't sustain this, these numbers of companies. And I recommend that you merge. And so not only did he push for them to merge, but he created subsidies. So the taxpayers were actually paying for some of these mergers, uh, either to uh, move factories around or, you know, uh, decommission equipment, even for some of the bonuses and golden parachutes for the executives. Because when they merged, there were two boards of directors, for example. So some of them had to step down. And the ones who stepped down had contracts that said, you know, if you ever are uh, terminated from service, you will get the following payment. You know, so some of the board members got maybe a quarter of a million dollars each uh, paid for by the taxpayers for the terrible uh, fact of not being able to go to board meetings anymore. And uh, then uh, Augustine himself, uh, in the way his contract was written, this was viewed as uh, being terminated by Martin Marietta, even though he was going to run the larger entity, Lockheed Martin. So he got about $8 million in uh, various uh, golden parachute uh, payouts, and about a third of that came from tax dollars. So not only was the government subsidizing it, but it ends up Perry and John Deutsch, uh, another Pentagon official at the time, uh, created the policy and had been uh, business associates of Norm Augustine. They had had consulting contracts with Martin Marietta right before they went into the Clinton administration and uh, created this policy to benefit the company. So uh, so there was a clear conflict of interest there, and there was a clear indication that this Augustine was a pretty skilled guy, because not only did he manage to gobble up all these companies, but he got the government to pay for it. Um, so he really built the foundations of the company that we see today. So what mechanisms, if any, are there for, let's say, let's start with the revolving door concept. It sounds like a lot of these guys bounce between the industry and the military and, and government. Well, you know, after some of the scandals and, and some of the obvious blatant conflicts of interest, uh, there were some provisions put in, but they were, you know, riddled with loopholes. I mean, basically, it said you cannot lobby your former agency, not the Pentagon, but your, your little sub-agency within the Pentagon where you did your work uh, for a two-year period after you lease government service. But you can go straight to a defense contractor, and you could help them strategize, and you could tell them who to talk to, and you could say, you know, hey, tell them, you know, John sent you. And uh, So basically, they could accomplish a lot of the same things even under this uh, these uh, strictures. And then it was... Um, they were at least uh, required to report, you know, how many people went uh, from the military into industry. And it ends up going back to the late 50s that had become a very prevalent, uh, you know, uh, practice. In fact, uh, Proxmire had done a study in the uh, early 70s, found 2,000 uh, military officers had gone to work for the top 95 defense contractors. So, uh, you know, he pointed out that if you're you know, negotiating with a company from inside the Pentagon or inside the military services, and all you're thinking about is how you're going to go work for them and get a big payoff, you're not going to be that tough on them in the contract negotiations. So I think a lot more needs to be done on the revolving door question. Some of the uh, suggestions have been, you know, you got to wait two years before you even go into industry, or you can't deal with the Pentagon on anything, uh, you know, when you go into industry for a, some sort of cooling off period. But it's a very hard um, thing to control. Similar to money in politics, uh, 
it sort of finds its way. You know, they, they f they'll find a way to use their special influence, uh, even if you come up with some sort of um, method or stricture or reform that is designed to, uh, you know, undercut that uh, process. Uh, so there's the revolving door. There's also been periodically um, attempts to get more competition in defense contracting. Uh, but that's a lot harder now because of the merger boom. There's so few companies. Uh, for example, Lockheed Martin uh, lost its F-22 combat aircraft program after a long fight with the Obama administration. But at the same time the F-22 was cut by about $4 billion, they threw another $4 billion at the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, which was also a Lockheed Martin product. So they basically broke even on the deal. And since they're the only supplier of fighter planes for the Air Force, and if the Joint Strike Fighter is, uh, you know, implemented, they'll be the only supplier of fighter planes to the Air Force, Navy, Marines, the Royal Navy, the UK Air Force, and uh, dozens of other countries. Uh, the notion of competition will be out the window. So, uh, and even when they did have it, uh, it was abused by the companies. There was a scandal in the Reagan years called Operation Ill Wind, and Lockheed was not a major player in this. It was mostly a Boeing operation. But basically, uh, they said you got to compete more of these contracts, both at the prime contractor level and for the subcontracts. And so what happened was um, there was a guy named Melvin Paisley who had been in the Navy uh, Department, and he came outside to Boeing, and he basically uh, said, you know, they set up fake companies, and they were giving them contracts. And the people that were sort of looking the other way inside the government came to work with Paisley and, and split the the profits of some of these fake companies. And uh, this was not revealed until, you know, probably four or five years after they had started doing this. So, um, you know, even when they've attempted to implement competition, the industry has been very hard to ride herd on and keep them from exploiting the, uh, the process. Yeah, it sounds like in addition to the companies like Lockheed Martin being too big to fail now, it's, they also sound like they're too big not to get the contracts. I think in a lot of ways that's true. Um, you know, it's interesting because even amongst the small number of contractors that exist, it doesn't seem like even now that they're deciding these things on the merits. It still seems like it's sort of who needs the contract at the moment. You know, do we need to keep Lockheed Martin going in this field? Let's give them this, you know, F-35 contract. Um, and then, of course, once something starts uh, rolling, it's very hard to stop it. I mean, the F-22 is kind of the exception that proves the rule because uh, President Obama threatened to veto any defense bill that included the F-22. And that had never been done before by any president. Secretary of Defense Gates gave major speeches on it, talked about how it's the most expensive fighter plane ever built. We're fighting two wars. We're not even using the thing. Um, and uh, they used pretty much all the power of the administration to lean on not only the Congress, but on Lockheed itself. I mean, they said, look, you got a lot of business with us, and you don't really want to go to the mat on this because we'll, you know, we'll go after some of your other programs and make it harder for you. Uh, but as I said, even though they eventually killed it, they threw them a bone by giving them an extra $4 billion for the Joint Strike Fighter program, uh, leaving them essentially even to where they were. And on the jobs front, uh, Gates actually argued that the F-35 would create more jobs than the F-22. So he sort of dodged that whole problem of, you know, that usually gives the companies leverage in trying to keep these things alive. But there's probably very few other projects that will be, would be as easy to uh, terminate as the F-22 just because it wasn't needed, it was so costly, they had an alternative in the F-35. Um, the F-35 now is having its own problems, but not clearly have anywhere to turn. I mean, some people have said, well, you can uh, upgrade things like the existing F-18 for the Navy, the F-15 for the Air Force. But uh, I, I think that would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but it, it would run against the grain of how defense procurement works. I mean, the idea that you would take a product that's working and just improve it instead of building something entirely new uh, just is not something that's been done in the annals of uh, Pentagon weapons procurement.
Can you, you talk a bit about uh, the Lockheed Martins, um, in addition to being the number one contractor uh, at the Pentagon, they appear to be doing pretty well with a lot of other uh, parts of the U.S. government? Well, they've branched out now. Um, I sort of joked in one of my pieces that they're sort of the, uh, you know, my candidate for the next big brother, because not only do they work for the CIA and the National Security Agency and the FBI, uh, they helped the Pentagon run a program called the Counterintelligence Field Activity, which uh, actually uh, for a certain time was spying on anti-war activists and peace activists. And their work for the National Security Agency included uh, assisting in programs that were used to intercept people's telephone calls and, and internet uh, interactions. So. Uh, you know, very directly, they were involved in spying. They also uh, had hired interrogators who worked at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. And then they do all kinds of information processing for the IRS, for the Census Bureau. Uh, they work for the Postal Service. They're working on the National Archives. Uh, they help train the transportation security agents who pat you down at the airport. Uh, so they've... Um, they run a big database on fingerprints for the FBI. Uh, so they're really uh, pretty much all service, uh, all purpose government contractor now. And, and that's really not entirely surprising because what they're good at is lobbying for government contracts. And so they've just applied those lobbying skills to another set of government agencies. And didn't you also write that they were embroiled with the uh, assassination program in Pakistan? Yes, uh, they ran a uh, contract, they were sort of the manager of a contract uh, where three companies that were supposed to be providing background information about Afghanistan, just the culture, the people, the history, not direct intelligence. Uh, it ends up they were actually uh, generating targeting information for assassinations of people who were suspected of being uh, Taliban or al-Qaeda leaders. And uh, this was being done by uh, spies and special forces and private uh, military employees uh, in Pakistan at a time when Pakistan was refusing to let uh, U.S. troops on the ground in their country. So they're trying to do an end, round, end run around that uh, provision. And uh, Lockheed Martin was managing the whole operation. Uh, they also... Uh, make the missiles that are used in the Predator drone strikes that, to actually kill people. And they also provide some of the intelligence for calling in the strikes. You know, where should we uh, aim the missiles? So they're, they're involved in, you know, all aspects of the sort of counter-terror uh, operations in Pakistan. And, um, you know, I think that's another part of the company that's maybe less known than things like, you know, producing fighter planes. And yet it seems to be a ever expanding uh, business well yes cuz they also uh they've got kind of you know almost their own foreign policy i mean they um have a division called PAE which uh originally stood for P Pacific Architects and Engineers and that company uh, made its fortune during Vietnam building military bases there uh but they branched out into things like uh, building bases for peacekeepers, building refugee camps. Uh, eventually, they, they've done things like recruit law enforcement personnel for countries. And so when uh, Lockheed Martin bought them, they started branching out even further. And so they were getting contracts to um, reform the justice system in Liberia, or they were hiring election monitors for elections in the Ukraine and Bosnia. Uh, they even had an employee, according to the Wall Street Journal, who helped write part of the Afghan Constitution. So uh, all these kinds of, it's almost like, you know, just as they were profiting from kind of the hard side of foreign policy, the weapons side, now they were getting into the, sort of the softer side, uh, profiting from diplomacy. And to uh, kind of highlight that, they actually gave a million-dollar contribution to the U.S. Institute of Peace. And so here you have this body set up by Congress, to uh, promote peaceful resolution of disputes, and they're getting a um, million dollars from the world's largest weapons contractor. Uh, and not only is it, are they going to get a you know recognition at, at the USAP's new headquarters, but they've got a lecture series sponsored by Lockheed Martin uh, 
where they'll have the Lockheed Martin logo and the programs. And this is all, um, you know, in in part to promote the these activities that they're involved in in peacekeeping and elsewhere. But they're now wondering whether this is as lucrative as they uh, hoped it would be, and that there's a possibility that they might put uh, parts of that uh, activity on the auction block. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens with that. But it would seem even if it is not financially lucrative that it gives them incredible power to have access to all this information uh, and control over all these different uh, programs. Well, yes. I mean, I think, you know, certainly to the extent that they're still bidding, um, they're wired in terms of inside information about what the government knows, what it's looking for. Um, and in some areas, like intelligence, um, there are now more private employees doing intelligence work for the U.S. government than there are, uh, you know, government employees. So there'll be some sensitive offices in the intelligence community where you've got contractor employees sitting right next to government employees, in many cases even supervising them. And so Lockheed Martin's a big part of that. They've been called by uh, Tim Shorak, who did a great book on all this called Spies for Hire, um, the largest intelligence private intelligence force in the world uh, because they have 52,000 employees who are cleared to do classified work, uh, many of them now working in the intelligence field. And they do things like uh, not just, you know, crunch data, but uh, help write the daily brief, daily intelligence brief for the president. Uh, they help run agents in different countries. Uh, you know, so they're really getting into the kind of active part of intelligence, not just you know, helping them get new computers or something like that. So you've been following these issues for many years. If um, if there was a the current administration or a new administration that put you in charge of uh, oversight and regulation and um, correction of large corporations like Lockheed Martin, what recommendations would you implement? Well, I think first of all, I'd go on the offensive. Uh, you know, I would just cut the Pentagon budget across the board by a substantial amount. Uh, we're spending about double what we were spending at the beginning of the George W. Bush administration, and more than every other country in the world combined, and the highest levels we've spent uh, since World War II. So a lot of that is unnecessary. We could cut $100, 200000000000 billion a year and still be by far the most powerful military in the world. And I think if you do that kind of thing, which was done to some degree at the end of the Vietnam War, less so at the end of the Cold War, it's harder for the companies to fight back. I mean, if it's just one weapon system, they can rally their forces, they can make the jobs argument. Uh, if it's an across-the-board policy, at some point, uh, even the lobbying power that they have is just, uh, you know, it's kind of like you, you set them back on their feet and they just don't know where to start. Uh, so I think that's one thing I would like to see happen. Another is some alternative uh, way to create jobs. And I think it's a very hard climate for that now because, I mean, you can't even get Congress to agree on extending unemployment benefits. But um, ideally, if you invested more in infrastructure, in green manufacturing, in other areas that have more growth potential than uh, the Pentagon, um, there would be more jobs for skilled people. And some of the people who might be laid off from something like the F-22 might have options, especially if there was um, some sort of retraining programs to help funnel people into some of the, you know, the new growth industries. But that's probably a long-term undertaking, just given the, the tenor of the country's politics at the moment. Um, I would probably take the revolving door. And, you know, a, a reporter said to me, you know, some people are saying make them wait five years before they can switch. And the advantage of that is, you know, they're really just selling their Rolodex. You know, here's who I know. And five years might, you know, the Rolodex would get a little stale, might not be as advantageous for the industry to hire them. So uh, I think there are things that can be done, but it, it would take, um, you know, strong presidential leadership and then Congress to somewhat get out of the way. Because a lot of times Congress actually adds things into the Pentagon budget that even the Pentagon itself has not requested, you know, based on pork barrel arguments. So it's not an easy problem, but I think we will have some opportunities now because of the deficit. Uh, the President's Deficit Commission uh, recommended cutting about $100 billion a year uh, from the military budget, which would be an amazing 
step forward from where we are now. Robert Gates just announced he would cut about $13 billion a year, which is just chump change in a $700 billion budget. So, um, you know, if they're actually going to try to reduce the deficit, and this isn't just all rhetoric, then it's going to be some harsh trade-offs between military spending and everything else the government does. And I think in that climate, people will cast a, a more critical eye on the Pentagon. And even members of Congress may be forced to uh, give up some of those their little goodies in the, you know, in the military field to make room for other programs that people want and need. Um, so I, you know, people have always asked me, well, you know, Bill, you've been doing this for 20, 30 years. I mean, you know, why do you think anything's going to change? And I guess what I would say is that there's unique moments where um, you've got, you know, maybe leverage that you didn't have at other times, like at the end of Vietnam, at the end of the Cold War, and military spending has been reduced. I think what we haven't been so successful at is changing the process. You know, if you could change, uh, you know, the job creation process, if you could change the revolving door process, if you could rein in some of our commitments around the world, uh, you know, the 700 bases we have and the commitments to go anywhere and do anything, uh, you know, if there were changes in our strategy, it'd be a little harder for the companies to sort of wrap themselves in the flag and say, this is why you need our transport plane, or this is why you need more nuclear weapons, or this is why you need our aircraft carrier. Uh, so I think, you know, part of it comes back to what, what do we want our country to do? You know, what does it take to defend the country? And if we don't need these things to defend the country, and we've got grave uh, fiscal problems, let's not do it. And I, I think a lot of times people feel like, well, it's it's beyond me. I mean, let the experts decide. I, I don't know how many fighter planes we need. But I think uh, there might at least be pressure to make sure that they're spending on things we need because of the deficit problem. All right. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. Well, I appreciate the chance to do it.